Yep. Joe. Thank you, Willie. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. It's quite an honor. Um, this is um, the result of a task group within um, GAWG that I chaired, and the effort uh, revolved around a very well-defined, um, answering a very well-defined question. Let's come up with a better value for the um, uh, absorption cross-section of ozone at 254 nanometers. And the reason we need this is because all um, tropospheric ozone measurements um, um, in the world in, to support regulatory and compliance issues are based on a NIST developed instrument called the Standard Reference Photometer, shown in the previous slide here, developed in the late 70s, early 80s, um, motivated by EPA regulations in the U.S. at that time. And they, this instrument um, um, began, uh, um, was a, uh, has been quite a success story in that it is a, the first real demonstration of amount of substance um, spectra based on um, linear absorption spectroscopy that is um, uh, based on observations of path length, number density, and an absorption cross-section, which is a, a, a molecular property or an invariant of a molecule or the analyte. And this is, um, um, these are widely disseminated. Uh, there are four of them, I believe now at BIPM. This is the standard for ozone measurements, the SI traceable standard. It's the primary method. And um, it's, um, but the, um, the issue is that um, it's based on a cross-section value that was determined in about 1960, 61. Um, Based by, um, by convention, this was used back in the 80s, um, and it's the so-called Hearn cross-section. Um, there have been a number of measurements since then, um, in the last 50 years, um, that um, illustrate, have indicated that um, the uncertainty was relatively large. And so um, we decided it was about time to um, reassess this cross-section value in light of the recent measurements and, and try to provide a consensus value which has a lower uncertainty. And so essentially it's based on the Beer-Lambert law. You have intensity coming in, and in the case of these uh, measurements, the, these instruments use mercury pen lamps. It's incoherent radiation. This is not a laser measurement. And you're probing a relatively broad band feature here, this um, Hartley band cross-section. And by coincidence, the mercury line is near the center of this this band in the UV. They, um, these instruments operate, um, it's very simple. You have um, uh, single pass absorption through about an 80 centimeter path length. And uh, it boils down to knowing the cross section, which we call sigma here. Um, the actual SRP instruments involve two cells in parallel in a kind of anti-symmetric fashion where you, in cycle one, you fill one with those on the other one is just air and then you repeat cycle two and invert the sample gas, and you have a common lamp and common, and then if you're doing this ratioing technique, all the common factors of transmission and reflection cancel out, and you end up with a, a, a measurement of um, uh, your, your, the observable on the left of four <laughs> intensity measurements can be related to the number density of the ozone, its cross-section and the total path length. Uh, so all of these quantities can be determined with low uncertainty to determine the most ozone cross-section. So the, S the current SRP uncertainty budget looks like this. We have um, two dominant components. There's the, the type A component due to the, um, the measurement of the beam intensities. And this is that's a function of ozone molar fraction. And I'm showing also under here the relevant um, concentration scales that are relevant to regulatory um, uh, regulations and ozone human health issues. And you can see that um, the, is, um, as soon as you get about, above about 13 parts per billion of ozone, um, the dominant cross-section is the type B uncertainty associated with the Hearn cross-section. It's about 2%. So the measurement can never be more accurate than that unless you reduce that uncertainty. Um, the uncertainty in number density and path length um, are, is about a factor of 40 below the Hearn cross-section. So the, the biggest tent pole to reduce here is the, from the point of view of uncertainty, is the cross-section. So um, we, um, we convened a task group, um, assembled a task group, and we 
identify, we first set out some ground rules, how we were going to do this, what were the criteria, what were the, um, um, you know, what was going to be the basis for doing this, um, this analysis. So we looked at publications since from 50, 1950 to 2016. We considered room temperature measurements only, but it turns out that the cross section of ozone is, uh, uh, this absorption cross section is only weakly dependent on temperature. So that was a very, uh, not a very strict um, assumption. Um, and we, we wanted to make sure that we didn't double count reported values in the literature from certain groups so that they were all independent measurements. And um, so that, that was an important consideration. We did not correct the data. We only, we only evaluated the uncertainties that were reported in the papers and added uncertainty where we deemed necessary or, or modified them accordingly. Um, and we use standard um, rules for evaluating uncertainties. Um, th this is the set of 14 publications we looked at. They range from, and they, they span the, um, all the, the decades, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And um, they are represent, they, they span a number of different techniques, including, um, well, preparation. And the big issue here is how do you prepare a known quantity of ozone um, and assess its purity and, um, uh, and then do the absorption measurement. And so there are essentially two ways uh, as far as traditionally people would, in the old days, they would um, generate nearly pure ozone by, um, th through discharge tubes and do some purity analysis and either use a dispersive spectrometer with a, a broadband light source or a mercury lamp. Or people would generate ozone and look at the rate of decomposition of ozone, so look at the pressure change as it decomposes to oxygen. And then there's a, there were three studies that relied on gas phase titration, so that's a different traceability chain. And those are based on the conversion of NO, um, the oxidation of NO by ozone to NO2. So um, using gas standards for these quantities, you can determine ozone. So we have a, a range of measurement types, which gives us some confidence that we're averaging over potential type B errors between the different data sets. So we looked at the type A and type B uh, reported uncertainties, added components where we thought was necessary. In particular, we looked at purity, as I mentioned. We also looked at the effect of multiple reflections. And in eight of the studies, um, this, this actually had a, an impact on the uncertainties. And we, we also considered not only single side, we, we, we assumed that the uncertainties could be um, double-sided and that there could be positive and negative going uncertainty elements that were not necessarily the same. And for example, if um, impurity um, considerations would tend to lead to a positive going error bar, and, and uh, the effect of multiple reflections where you underestimate the path length goes the other direction. So we actually um, took a careful look at these two effects and modified the uncertainty components accordingly. This is how we analyzed the, um, the effect of uh, multiple passes through the cell. We actually came up with a, 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 um, a simple model to account for this effect and simply uh, the reverberation of a of, a, of the light between two parallel windows. And what happens is the geometrical, the, the actual path length that you really need to use is um, greater than the geometrical path length between the windows, which leads to an underestimate or an overestimate of the cross section. This um, effect um, changed our final result by 0.08%, I might add. Um, we did a statistical analysis based on a Monte Carlo distributions. Um, we, again, we assumed symmetric uncertainties for six of the cases where this multi-pass effect, well, and, and um, well, where, where there, there was no ec, um, um, extra components um, in either direction, and asymmetric uncertainties using a skew-normal distribution. We randomly sampled the probability density functions to compute the means and the variance for each, each case. And we also looked at the, a Dersimonian layered analysis to um, provide any evidence of um, sort of so-called dark variance associated with interlaboratory variability that could not be captured by the um, uncertainties that were assigned. 
So this is the skew normal distribution, which is a three parameter distribution, which it degenerates into the normal distribution when the uncertainties are, the, are identical. Um, so for those um, cases where we had asymmetric uncertainties, which we assigned, we, um, and a known mean value, which was the reported value from the paper, we were able to um, calculate a particular skew normal distribution for that particular case, and that is the distribution that we sampled with the Monte Carlo distribution. And the point of these distribution functions was to assume, uh, assign weighting factors for each of the studies, which, um, which gave us a weighted mean. Um, these weighting factors also depend on, uh, in, in general, through the Dersimonian layer um, analysis, the so-called tau term, which is a measure of this inner laboratory variance. Again, we saw very, it comes in as a weighting factor, um, and we found very little evidence of any, um, um, it had a very little importance. So the, ultimately the weighting factors for each case was the, um, the inverse of the variance of the probability distribution um, for whether it be symmetric or asymmetric. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, and it, when you look in the final analysis, 90% um, of the, the weight was, um, could be attributed to six of these studies. We, threw out, we did not throw out any data of, of the 14 studies. All of them contributed, to the, but these are the six that contributed to the most. These include uh, the measurements done here at BIPM, reported in 2015 on pure ozone um, by Joel Villalone. And um, um, those measurements um, had the, the lowest uncertainty and therefore the highest weight. Um, there were two um, sets of measurements based on gas phase um, titration um, as well as um, uh, four other, three others that were um, based on just direct absorption of relatively pure ozone. So here I'm looking at the, um, the, the distribution functions of the data before and after the weighting. The red curve shows the, rel the original distribution function. You see it looks somewhat bimodal and, and highly skewed. After weighting the data, we get more, a more symmetric distribution and a, a narrower distribution function. These are the final um, results in terms of looking at the distribution about the mean value represented by this red line. Um, the blue uh, error bars are our final uncertainties, uh, including, um, and they are in some cases asymmetric, although the, the, the extent of asymmetry is not very great, and nor did we change any of the uncertainties by more than about 20% in most cases. There was only one study where there was a fourfold increase in the, in the uncertainty budget. Um, again, the, the, the Dersimonian layered analysis is actually illustrated on the graph, but it's a, it, it, there are thin lines that are imperceptible here. So there's essentially no evidence of inner laboratory variability within the, uh, the precision of these measurements. So it, um, here I'm showing how our result compares against the Hearn value, which is the current standard value. We have shifted the uncertainty by 1.23% downward, or, or the, the cross section, I, I mean. Cross section is lower than it was, and its uncertainty is a factor of six times smaller, this, uh, this consensus value, by comparison to the, the Hearn value, which is currently used for the SRP. Recently, there was a, um, a study commissioned by WMO, by the AXO group, um, Absorption Cross-Section of Stratospheric Ozone. And these are people primarily interested in, in stratospheric observations of ozone. They um, use this set of data here. You can't read it very well, I think, but um, the, they double counted some of, uh, some of these studies that we didn't, and they didn't include every study that we did, and they didn't do the weighting the way we did it. So we um, actually have a shift of about 0.3% relative to that study, and so I think it sort of illustrates the value added by this additional level of scrutiny. Um, so in summary, we've um, reduced the um, absorption or the uncertainty by about a factor of six and um, relative to the standard value or the conventional values now. So that's pretty significant. So now we can look at the, 
the result, the before and after. Now our, our uncertainty um, going from on the left is the current state and to the right. We now have an uncertainty which does not limit the accuracy of the SRP measurement until you get to about 100 ppb, which is in the high end of the actual range that's typically observed in most um, situations. So I think that's a, a big um, step forward. And not only does this have a value for tropospheric observations of ozone, it's also relevant to um, stratospheric observations and, and, and um, just any spectroscopic observations in general because over the years there's been a lot of um, uh, difficulty in reconciling measurements of ozone amount of substance through um, uh, various forms of spectroscopy, whether they be UV absorption or visible uh, um, measurements in the visible, near infrared or far infrared or microwave regions. And getting consistency between these regions is difficult. And um, generating a consistent set of observations from stratus from um, for remote sensing um, will re requires that this uh, that there be anchor points and this 254 nanometer cross section is now a very good anchor point for these types of measurements and will also help um, confirm and uh, consolidate measurements in longer wavelength regions. So there there's definitely going to be a need to um, disseminate this these, this information to that community. So now if we compare our, our new results to recent data that have um, been, um, that are in the literature, um, we see these two new values and we see quite good agreement. Um, and so that's encouraging and you know, these are state of the art measurements, one from um, Christoph Janssen and this is actually not technically, is not published, but um, he has the smallest uncertainty that's ever been reported for this measurement of ozone because of his um, efforts to um, establish the purity of the samples. And then there was a recent measurement by Manfred Burke at DLR in Germany using FT spectroscopy in the UV. And they're, they're pretty much right on the, the money. And here I'm trying to show that if you included the Janssen number in the mix, it would only bring the, uncert the uncertainty down to about a quarter of a percent. Um, if, you, if it's business as usual and you, you do um, three more measurements at the BIPM level, you're only down to 0.2%. Um, so it's going to take some, a big improvement in the measurement, um, big lowering of the measurement uncertainty to make a big change in the number that we've come up with here. So I think the number that we're reporting is going to stand, is going to be around for a while. Um, unless we get below the tenth of a percent level on, in uncertainty, it's going to be difficult. And that is sort of the state of the art right now in, in high resolution molecular spectroscopy with lasers. And this is um, an area that I'm actively involved in. So I think the number that we re we're reporting has, um, um, it, it has legs. Um, and quickly, I want to mention that this has a, a, an impact on the, the rate of compliance. Uh, it will have an impact on the rate of compliance. Uh, with regard to, um, or non-compliance, I might say, in urban areas. And this is a recent, based on a recent study um, by SOFIN in 2015. This curve, this graph shows um, how much more non-compliance there would be if they adopted the BIPM value from 2015, which, by the way, is um, about two, th it's um, 60, well, it's 30 percent greater than, di different than her than our value is. And as the cross-section goes down, the, uh, the um, concentration goes up. So for a given measurement, there'll be more um, exceedances of the limits. And you'll see that if we adopt a new value, oops, uh, the scale will change by two-thirds here. But you'll still have 15 to 20 percent excess noncompliance. So in conclusion, how come this is not moving? Oops. I just want to say um, thank you to um, the organizers and, and for giving me the chance to say this. And thank you to the task group and especially Joel VLL at, at BIPM. <laughs>